I'm glad to have you here. I'm glad you could actually uh, join for this particular session. My name is Jim Mitchell. I'm the minister of the Cherokee Hills Congregation on the northwest side of Oklahoma City. Uh, just a rock's throw down the road, but uh, excited to be here. Um, my wife and I actually also own uh, Ivan Stewart's Open Bible Study Materials. Uh, many of you are familiar with that. Some of you are not. We'll let you stop by um, the, the booth and talk to us about it. Uh, the topic that I have this, this afternoon is dealing with Paul and his, his elements of teaching. Uh, I know oftentimes when you hear people saying, well, in some kind of lesson there's a, uh, there's a thematic statement, there is a, a root passage that we discuss, and then you have three main points. How many points did Jesus have in the Sermon on the Mount? Have you thought about that? If we're talking about what Paul used as his style of teaching, where do you find it? Well, you can see it and you hear it as, as Luke records those missionary journeys. But there's something that he writes. There's something that Paul writes to Christians in the city of Thessalonica that actually detail for us exactly what's involved in the way that he taught. So I'd like to encourage you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be spending our time in chapter 2. Beginning in verse number 1. You yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. Verse 3 and verse 4. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. And if you kind of analyze what is he actually saying in verse 3 and verse 4. What he is suggesting is there is a thought behind everything that is actually proclaimed. What's the thought behind it? Sometimes if you, if you talk to individuals that are guest speakers and say, well, how did you pick that topic? Well, I called the elders before um, the, the week that I was going to be there and asked them, what should I preach upon to the congregation. And sometimes you hear, just preach the word. That's what we need, just preach the word. Well, that doesn't tell them anything about what kind of struggles, weaknesses that may be affecting the congregation, strengths that they may have. What is the thought behind it? And what Paul says as he's writing to the Christians in Thessalonica, the way that we were teaching you was not in deceit, it was not an error. We are speaking not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. What's the thought behind it? And then you start thinking, okay, how does that affect what Paul said to a congregation? How does that affect what he said in areas where there were no congregations? His approach to Corinth, when he's writing to Corinth, is different than his approach to Christians in Ephesus. His approach to Colossae, the Christians in Colossae was different than what he approached to those in Thessalonica. Are there similarities? Sure there are. In fact, I guarantee you, every, every inspired letter that we read has something that hits us in very specific ways. And you think, well, okay, so when, when Paul is writing the letter to the Colossian Christians, he says that um, a, there's a letter to the Laodiceans that you need to read. They need to read what I've written to you. Was he writing identical letters? No. Was he dealing with problems that are similar? Probably. But there are some specifics that have to be involved. I need to know those to whom I speak. I need to know something about their background. I need to know something about their interest. I need to know something about the way that they think, how that, what they think, and how they think will relate back to the way that I can start approaching them with the truth of God's word. The thought behind it is crucial. For example, think about Acts chapter 17. Think about the way that Paul, when he's in Athens, he goes to begin, like he always does, to the synagogue, then to the marketplace. And then you have those, those philosophers 
that are intrigued. And they say, Let's, we want to hear what this babbler, the Greek word is seed picker. What does this seed picker have to say? Seed picker. Yeah, they think he's grabbing this kind of information from this kind of mystical mindset. Something else from some other area. We want to know what he's saying because he's, he seemed to be talking about foreign gods. So we want to know what that actually involves. What's the point of his message? And the way he starts out with those philosophers is different, I guarantee you, than what he started out with when he's in the synagogue. I've got to be aware of the, th that there's a thought behind the way I approach people with the gospel of Christ. We know that. Paul illustrates it. He talks about the principle that's involved when he's writing to the Christians in Thessalonica. If you continue on, let's go from verse 3 and 4 down to verse number 5. For neither at any time do we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. So if I'm involved in sharing the gospel in a meaningful way, there's a thought process that goes, goes to the very forefront of everything that we're doing. But what he says in verse number five is not just the thought behind it, but the expression of it. It's not a, a cloak it's not something that we're trying to, to pull over somebody's eyes. We didn't use flattering words. We're not actually doing anything with covetous reasons. God is witness. Thought behind it, the expression of it, how to actually state that message. But then it goes even beyond that. In the very next statement, verse number six, nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. The thought behind it, the expression of it, and you've got to include the attitude in it. Paul, I'm not there to make a name for myself. Paul would say, I am not there to actually glow in the bask of those kind of, of heightened comments that people make about, you know, I've never heard that that way before. That's awesome. That's fantastic. Ever so often, um, you may run across somebody that, that either writes or states, I figured out something that nobody else has ever figured out about the Word of God. There was a, there was a book, and I picked it up not too long after I uh, after, uh, attended Free Hardeman. In fact, it's, uh, it, it was uh, one of the older preachers that, uh, that's no longer on, on, on this side of eternity, but he's passed on. And I've heard him speak before, but there is a book that he wrote. And in the beginning of that book, as he's dealing with a false concept that you found in the denominational world, he, he made the statement, I, in my plain and humble manner, and I'm thinking, you have just lost me. So I, and I underline things now, but I was using a highlighter back then. So I started looking at I, 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 I. It's all over the page. Next page, I, 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 I. So there's a problem at the beginning, at very beginning of the book. It's never I, 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 or me, me, me. It's God, 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 God. And it's when somebody says, well, I figured this out, and nobody has ever printed this before. How do you know? Nobody's ever figured this out before. How do you know? The only way for you to know that is that, well, I, I know the mind of everybody who has ever lived since, since this, this statement was, was wet on the parchment when it was first penned by inspiration. I know what everybody in every generation, every country has thought about this. No, you don't. If we're not careful, we can become kind of absorbed with, we're excited about what we see. Nothing wrong with that. But I guarantee you, other people have been just as excited when they figured out the same thing that we have finally figured out on our own, maybe not even on our own. We've had influences and concepts that have been happening in classes, in, in sermons that we've heard, in putting those things together. Have you ever noticed sometimes in Bible classes that you had somebody, and it looks like just by their expression, the light bulb finally goes off? Something that mm, maybe a Christian should have understood, but maybe they didn't prior to that moment in time. When Paul is teaching people, there is a thought process that is very, very real. 
And the expression that he uses is connected to that thought process. Why do you say things the way that you do? Look at the background of the people. That's the reason that we approach that the way that we do. It doesn't change the message. The message still remains the same. But the thought that goes into that is something that's vital. Can't just pick up and open up God's word and say, okay, here is, a, is exactly the way that this is going to relate to you without knowing what that person has gone through or what they know or what they don't know. And understanding that guards the way that we use words. The more the expression, the attitude that we have, because that comes across. The attitude that we have when we're talking to people comes across. And sometimes we may not mean it to sound as though, you know, it's like, well, you should have figured this out a long time ago is the way it kind of sounds. Maybe in the way that we, in the inflection we use. And if that's anywhere in the back of our mind, I guarantee you, if we're not careful, that can come across in the attitude that we have. Those three items are things that are intricately connected together. Paul, what kind of elements do you have in your teaching? He's given us three right here. And you can think about these and go back and plug them into the, the narrative of those missionary journeys in Acts. And while we have more details in some of those, some of those places where he visited and where that message was shared than we do in others, you can see these. You can almost hear these the way he responds to people around him as he shares the story of Jesus, the Christ, and talks about the resurrected Messiah. There's the thought that's behind it. There's that expression that is used. There's the attitude that you hear, and it's not something that is haughty. It's not something that's arrogant. If you continue, the very next verse, verse number, verse number 7. But as we were gentle among you, we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. I know that's not the complete sentence, but there is a point just in that phrase that needs to be understood. We were gentle, which gets back to the attitude, but we were gentle among you just as that caring mother, just as that mother that's nursing that, that small child. What you see, you can talk about it in concern or compassion, maybe use the word care how do we teach people we got to think about the approach we got to be aware of the expressions that we use we need to have that right attitude as we deal with people but there's the compassion that has got to come it's, it's interrelated the compassion is going to be picked up when the attitude by which we use those expressions the compassion the care, the concern. If we're talking to somebody who's not a Christian and, and they feel like we are trying to hurry up a study with them because this has just lagged on too long, you've asked too many questions, I can't believe you can't get the concepts down, we've gone over and over this. If they feel any of those things, care and concern doesn't show in what we're doing. And we've lost somebody that we could have reached for the gospel of Christ. Now, Paul's, Paul's method would change from one group of people to another, but his compassion for him didn't change. Think back to what he writes to Christians in the city of Rome, which he's, he's never met, but he's talking um, in chapter 10 about the heart's desire that he had. Prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You can hear the compassion. Our brother and record, they have, a, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They're trying to establish their own righteousness. They haven't yielded to the righteousness of God. Paul, what are you saying? I care about those people. I want to reach them with the gospel. And you almost think Paul, Paul could be thinking, you know, if, if anybody can reach these people, surely because I've been there. I know their background. I know the way they think. That's the way I used to think. But some of them are just as stubborn as I used to be. And look at what it took to convert me to Christ. 
I'm not going to give up on them. My care for them, my concern for them is very, very real. So now we've got, we've got four things so far as Paul's elements that are very much involved in his teaching. And the question for us is, well, how much of these so far do we have? How much of these are in our wheelhouse? How much thought goes into, if we're, if we're actually sitting down for the first time with somebody that is not a Christian, how much thought have we put into that study even before we actually step across the threshold into their home? And once we step in and start talking with them, I'm, I'm not going to jump right into, well, I know where you go to church and I think you're wrong, or I know you're wrong. The Bible doesn't say that. It's just, uh, I need to find out what kind of hurts they have. I need to find out what kind of, of knowledge they do or do not have. I want to find out about their background. And that, that's true of the time about non-Christians or somebody that's maybe weak in the faith. Or we're talking about somebody that's a strong Christian. Uh, the thought, the process is, I want to find out everything I can that they know that I haven't actually examined yet, and I want to learn. We can actually learn certain things from non-Christians, depending upon where they are in life. How did they go through those kind of problems? And as I learn those kind of situations they faced, Mm, that actually puts more, um, more ideas into how do I actually approach it. So how do, how do I express that? And the attitude that I have of actually having the love of Christ, something that shows through in the words that I speak, they've got to see all of this pulled together in that care and that compassion and that concern. And they can never think that he's just here and he's looking at his watch or she's looking at, at her watch. Um, maybe they really don't want to be here that much to begin with. Paul, in those missionary journeys, I guarantee you would have stayed longer in a lot of those towns if the animosity had not become so severe that the brethren had to put him somewhere else. You know, at the close of Acts, he's there meeting with the, uh, the elders at Ephesus for the very last time. And in fact, at the end of that chapter, you know, it's, it's, uh, when, when they actually hug him and they're falling on his neck and kissing him, the thing that they are upset about the most is the fact that he says, I'm never going to see you again. This is the last time I'm going to be with you. But he talked about the three years he was there. He talked about night and day. He talked about the way that he was actually pouring out himself and sharing the message of the gospel. Every one of these items is written all over that tremendous, very emotion-filled statement that he makes to those Ephesian elders. And that's got to be part of our, our elements of, of teaching. No matter who we're sharing the gospel with or who we're encouraging, maybe it's a, a young Christian, but those things have to be present. And if I continue on, that's not, he doesn't stop there. So in verse number 8, he says, So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. Paul, what are you saying? What's the element of teaching? What's involved in teaching? It's not just the thought. It's not just the express, not just the attitude, not just the concern. But it's the heart that it possesses. We are living among you. We were, we were, when we were there with you in Thessalonica, we were living in such a way that we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but our own lives. You are our heart. We would die for you. I guarantee you if non-Christians believe that our concern and love for them is so tremendous that we would be willing to die for them. And in our mind, if, if we can die, and die for them and give them a longer period of time to learn what they need to do to become a Christian, which one of us would say, well, I don't think I'd do that. The love of the souls of humanity has got to be so significant that what Paul says here in this inspired letter 
is something that, that we've got to be infused with. And something that's got to be who we become, who we are. We were down at the uh, Revive Us Again uh, lectureship at uh, Heritage University just a few months ago. One of the statements that was made, and it was a young man that had spent years in a foreign country as a missionary. And I never had thought about this before, but he said, you know, he said, when I'm there, immersed in that culture, every person I see, every person I talk to, it could be a clerk in a, in a store, it could be a, a food vendor out on the street, somebody walking a pet, but everybody I see is somebody I realize I need to share the gospel with that person because I'm there as a missionary. He said, you know, when I came back to the States, I didn't have that same feeling. You'd see people in the grocery store, didn't think about really starting up a conversation with them, asking them some pertinent questions. Uh, up to the day I think Ivan Stewart died, he said there are two questions that really are the, among the greatest that you can ask to see where that interest lies to set up a Bible study. And one of them was, do you think most people are going to heaven? And then he said, it doesn't matter what they say. Yes, no. It doesn't matter. His second question was, why do you think that? It doesn't matter what kind of response they get. Well, I think that because of this, or I think that because of that. He said, the third question is, how would you like to confirm that answer out of your own Bible? We can get together Tuesday afternoon or Thursday night, which works better for you. He said, the other question was, do you think the Ten Commandments are still binding on us today? Didn't matter what they said. Yes, no. Why do you think that? Didn't matter what they said. How would you like to confirm your answer out of your own Bible? We can get together Thursday afternoon, Friday night. The last week before he went to the hospital, he actually uh, talked to a waitress and got her name and phone number and passed it on to the brother who was over the education, education department where, no, the... Um, evangelism department where he actually attended and then he went to the hospital and never came out but the way that we try to connect with people is something that's got to incorporate those elements of teaching we've got to see everybody around us uh, personally i've got uh, i've got two people right across the street from me i've had some conversations um, not going to be able to set up a bible study with one of them the other one, hopefully, there's a guy two doors down, however. Um, he's on total disability from, uh, um, from serving in the military. Still gets out and plays golf almost every day. I'm not sure how that happens. You play golf every day, but you're on total disability. But uh, we've had some discussions trying to lead up to setting down that time. I'm still hopeful that will happen but I should have actually had that occur already. Maybe I'm working too slow on asking questions or engaging this conversation. But we've got to get to a point where if we were in a mission field where we would see everybody as somebody that needs the gospel of Christ, we need to have that same kind of mindset, that same kind of a process of, of analyzing where we are here when we see everybody around us. Maybe just asking a simple question. And oftentimes we don't do that. Paul's elements of teaching are tremendous. But it doesn't stop with these. If you continue down in, uh, in verse number 9. You remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. Paul, what are you saying? This took effort. It wasn't something that just, it just happens. It involves effort. I've got to make a point to talk to that person. I've got to make a, a point to wherever, whatever situation I find myself in for a, on a daily basis, differences in, in those circumstances. And sometimes I run across people and say, well, I'm not a people person. I just can't talk to people. Okay. Uh, my follow-up typically is, do you like to read? 
And it's surprising how many people say, I, I'm not a people person. I don't like to talk to people. But, well, yeah, yeah, I, I love to read. What do you like to read? And it could be a whole host of things. But the follow-up, there's always a follow-up. Do you realize that every person is a walking book? Chapters have been written in their life. And you can read those chapters by getting acquainted with them. Some of those chapters are going to be extremely joyful. Some are going to be filled with, with tragedy and heartache and sorrow. But every person is a walking book. If you like to read, I guarantee you that you'll get more enjoyment out of the book that is that person's life. Because they'll tell you. You don't have to read the pages. They'll tell you. And sometimes, well, I just, <clears throat> I'm just not that kind of person. Well, what kind of person are you? What can we do? There's an effort that's involved in this. Anybody that's involved in, 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 in leading somebody to Christ will tell you that there are some questions that may, they may have asked along the way that, man, you had to do some digging. You had to think about, how am I going to approach this? There are some objections that they raised that we, we actually got to solve these kind of problems. It's not the case, and Paul's a testament to that. Paul, it's not the case that everybody you speak to is on that jump at the chance to become a Christian. You have a lot of pushback. There's effort involved in this. And then there's one more, one more point that you find in what he says. Starts in verse 10, goes through verse 12. You are witnesses, and God also how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe, as we know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, there's a principle and an application in those three verses. The principle is in verse 10. How devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. That's a principle. The application is that you walk worthy of God who calls you in his own kingdom and glory. Paul, what are you seeing? There is a righteousness that has got to be maintained. And sometimes that's where we fall flat. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. But sometimes individuals think, well, I, I, I can't become a Christian because I can't live a perfect life. Great, neither can I. I've made tremendous mistakes in my past. Great, I understand I have too. I'll make mistakes again in the future. All of us will, but the key is Jesus died that those sins could be removed jesus gave an example that we should follow his steps you know when peter makes that when you, peter uses that phrase jesus left us an example it's the only time in the new testament that that word is used and it literally means the headline of a copy book jesus left us the headline of a copy book that we should follow his steps now what in the world could that possibly mean and you think back to the uh, rabbinic schools where those young students would come and they'd be given a blank tablet with the, uh, the writing of the rabbi at the top, writing from right to left. They don't write backwards, we do. Uh, but writing from right to left. And the student has to copy that. Remember back when you were in school, first grade, the funny paper with a really weird line on it and you had the perfect alphabet at the top? And first time you tried, how perfect did it look? It didn't look perfect at all. Hard, hard time staying in the lines. But the more you practiced, the more you wrote, over and over and over and over, it started to look better. Jesus is the perfect writing at the top of our copy book. When we start writing and trying to, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, we, our writing looks terrible. We fall over and over and over. But the more we practice, the more we work at it, the more we commit ourselves to it, that, that effort that it involves, that concept of righteousness is something that will grow. Will we ever get it perfectly right? No. But the longer we're a child of God, our writing should be a whole lot more like 
the master than when we began. Paul's elements of teaching, and he doesn't list them that way, but he gives them to us in detail. You know the intriguing thing about this? If I start thinking about how should I be a teacher, it's this way. The thought that it involves, the expression of it, the attitude in it, the care, the concern, the compassion that's present. And if I have that, that kind of heart and that kind of effort and work towards having that kind of righteousness, I guarantee you that people with whom we share the gospel will see that. And it's not because we're great. We're not but it's because Jesus is. And that's the pattern. I know there are a lot of individuals here that have a lot of, uh, a lot of different approaches to sharing the gospel, which is tremendous. In fact, uh, I've, I've talked to several, so, well, you know, I've got, I've got several kind of in my wheelhouse. Terrific. You know, and I think that this works with this person better be better than something else. That's fantastic. Uh, I have used Open Bible Study almost exclusively for years. I love the way it's put together. Uh, for me, it works. Uh, not because, of, well, you know, I haven't did a lot of research when you put it together. But the reason it works is because of these kind of items that you plug into it. I guarantee you, if these are missing, if any of these are missing, we are shortchanging ourselves, but we're definitely shortchanging the people with whom we're sharing the message. Every one of these is vital. Every one of these is vital. So how am I going to be a teacher of the gospel? The way that Paul was. How did he do it? This way. And he writes about it, and it's almost something you think, well, that's, he's just writing uh, to the Christians in Thessalonica uh, about what he went through when he was there. Exactly. But along the way, he gives us every little detail of what's involved where we shortchange it where we try to, to have a shortcut sometimes it's on the effort that it involves well okay I've, so i've got this material well how, how well do you know that material well not really well but it kind of it kind of does its own thing so if i'm actually involved in a bible study whatever way of evangelism that i'm using um, to actually get that story of Jesus into the mind and heart of that non-Christian. If I'm not that familiar with the process that I'm using, and then I wonder, well, why, why, uh, why aren't I more successful? That time, the effort that needs to be put into it. Uh, I'll give you a case in point. I haven't said that to people right, right out of the gate, uh, never having used up a Bible study before and teaching somebody. We'll baptize four to five out of ten. Forty percent. Fifty percent if they're lucky. Yeah, not bad. Well, maybe that's not that not that good. But individuals that actually know why it's it's organized the way that it is, why we're starting with with the authority of God's word and the fact that the 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 gospel of Christ, the new covenant, has replaced the old. Uh, why we're actually going through steps the way that they are actually uh, actually arranged in, in those lessons. If I understand that, you can, you can get to points, you don't have to have the page, in you know exactly where it's going. You know what kind of questions that person needs to, needs to be asked and what they need to understand about those verses. But it takes effort. And that's got to be something that we engage in. There's a, um, in fact, uh, I was made aware of that just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, a young man named uh, Kyle Frank of, of texting back and forth, but uh, uh, I got a call. He said, I, I, I think I may, well, I actually called from the publisher, who's a friend of mine. He said, I, I got a, a gentleman I need to talk to. He's, he's, uh, he's really kind of uh, freaking out. Um, he says he thinks he's actually uh, overstepped his boundary in some copyright infringement, and uh, he doesn't want any kind of problems. So what's, what's the situation? So a young man named Kyle Frank was very, very steeped in the occult. Uh, not too long after he was married, he and his young bride made their own Ouija board and started using it. And he said uh, they thought they were talking to uh, getting responses from dead relatives. 
And he said it got to the point that it would consume them. After work, they would actually work on getting answers on that Ouija board until the sun came up the next morning, almost every day of the week. He said, and, and people talk or think about this, this is just a joke. He said, this can consume you. And he talks about getting deeper and deeper, more deeply involved in the occult. And they started trying to think, oh, how, how do we get out of this? This is terrible. And, and somebody approached him with a Bible study called Open Bible Study. Bible Stewart. And the concern that Kyle had was inside this, he actually shared every question that's on that open Bible study, every passage, and how you responded to it. And I said, uh, listen, that, that is a positive story for the power of studying God's Word. And it's as powerful an example as anything that I have seen. Can I share that book with others? Interesting story. And if you've used other, other methods of evangelism, you may have similar story. Use what you know. And then expand. Use what you know. And then compare that with other ways to approach the gospel of Christ with somebody that's, a, that's not a Christian. But every single one of these elements that Paul referred to, kind of in a passing fashion, when he's writing Christians in Thessalonica, has to be involved in who we are, has to be involved in what we do, and has to be involved in the way that we come across with the world around us. Um, more and more, we are living in very cynical time. And the kind of concern of people that have been put off by individuals that would state that they are Christians, but live in ways unbecoming Christianity, has turned a lot of people off. How to get them back. These elements of teaching go a long way in reversing that trend. Because if we're not careful and try to short circuit those items, we're not going to be doing all that we could for the cause of Christ. I think in a lot of ways, in, uh, in you know, starting out preaching, and it's been about 40 plus years, I guess, since I've been doing this. Uh, it, a top, I understand there's a need for topical lessons, but I guarantee you that there, are, there is a richness involved in just a chapter or a paragraph, a partial chapter like we've done here. A greater richness found in God's Word in that context of Scripture than we often would actually think, well, I've got to hunt around for, for different points. Well, it depends on the topic. Maybe that's true. More times than not, that's not going, not going to be an introduction, one, two, three points and a conclusion. Once in a while, maybe. But more times than not, the richness, the depth of what you can find in God's Word is there in black and white, sometimes in red, right in that chapter. We don't have to search all over the New Testament to look at what we need to do and who we need to be. What Paul writes here is phenomenal. And as you study with people, I would like to encourage you from time to time, open your New Testament back up to this particular passage and read through it again. And notice what Paul is saying because he gives us the elements he used in teaching people. And if we want to be as effective or anywhere close in reaching the lost, as was Paul. These items need to be things that become a very, a very intricate part of who we are as we share that message. Before we actually leave, let's, let's close our time out with a prayer. Our Father and God in heaven, we're so thankful for the, the blessings that you share down upon us every day and pray that more and more we will be mindful and aware of how often those blessings come our way. Help us, Father, in the midst of obstacles that happen in life to see the opportunities that are always present. Help us to be aware of the truth that you have placed within your word in such a way that it can and does and should 
instill us to, to learn more, to grow stronger, to, to find more ways to apply your word, not just in our life, but to share it with those around us. Help us, Father, to be people that actually really do hunger and thirst for everything that we find in these verses. Help us, Father, to be willing to dig deeper sometimes than we ever have in the past and recognize that there is a wealth of information that lies under the surface that if it remains untouched, we starve ourselves from that strength that can come as we feast upon your word. Please watch over us, Father, in the, the Bible studies in which we are engaged currently. Help us be aware of opportunities and make use of those opportunities to reach out to those around us who are lost. Help us, Father, as missionaries in our neighborhoods where we live, see ourselves as needing to reach out to, to everybody on each street with the message of Jesus and what individuals need to do to become a part of your family. Thank you, Father, for this conference, for the, the lessons that have been shared already this week, for the great lessons yet to come. Help us, Father, to take the enthusiasm that we feel and not let it wane, but help it to grow stronger. Not our will, Father, but yours be done in all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys very, very much for being here.